I received several questions from you guys uh, from WebWork and also from um, the writing project. So that's good. In the class, I don't receive a lot of feedbacks from you guys. I see your face. I don't read anything. So I don't know how fast I am I going. Am I going too fast or am I going too slow? So either way, it will be really nice if you guys can provide me uh, some feedbacks during the class. Another thing is um, I receive questions from the homework. I realize I don't ask uh, people at the beginning if you have any questions in the homework so I can go over some of them in class. Um, as you can see, the homeworks are pretty complicated for this class. I'm pretty confident that I can do the majority correctly, but I may mess up with the sign and the small decimal, so I still confuse you by giving you the wrong number, even the right procedure. So from now on, at the beginning of every single class, I will ask you guys if you have any question, okay? And then, uh, take it back, not, 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 not during class. I will ask you if you have any questions during your homework, just send me an email and tell me which one, okay? So I can prepare before class to make sure I get all the numbers right. And then in class, I will show it to everybody. Sounds good? Okay, so web work, writing projects, anything you have, just send me an email. And if you feel like, I, I, and if I receive several uh, same questions from the same, from different person, I would just go over it in class. Okay. Doug, do you have questions? Yeah, just to check right away on the writing project. Do we have to do A and B or is A it- A and B both, one? yep. Okay, thanks. Yep. Okay. So I would say for the first writing project, I said 200, uh, 20 points, right? So that's A and B, each one is 10 points. I didn't say that in the, in the thing. Okay, so let's see web work. This one I received several times. 1.2, number eight. Okay, I think you know the original problem. The harder part is more about how to do the integration of this thing, assuming K and C are constant. While your P is actually your function, right? Okay. And to solve that, what we realize is this one is clearly separable because this is nothing but a constant. Constant, everything related to P. So we can move everything related to P on this side. Mr. Chen, can you show your screen? Oh, oh, oh. Good point. Okay, number eight. We have P as a function of T, and then you have C, you have K, which are constants. Okay, we try to solve for P as a function of T. All right, so DP over DT equals this. We realize everything related to P is here, so we can move it on the other side to make it separable. What over? Remember to remove DT on the other side. And once you take the integration, it becomes easy. I'm going to use this one as a constant D. Now, several of you have mentioned before, it's been a while you took calculus and it's been a while you took linear algebra. So you need to catch up. One thing I promise you is I won't give you anything ridiculous in the exam. So you basically just need to know I need to solve a differential equation and it's usually the integration will be easy unless it's impossible for some techniques for me to put easy questions, okay? Now the key is try to solve this. This one, if you feel confused, you try to help yourself a little bit. Number one is you set K to be one. You just wanna see the structure, right? So it really doesn't matter what K is. Number two, you can change your P to be X, if that makes you feel more comfortable. Okay, now with log, you can see if it's one over X, I can change it to be X by adding a negative one in the front. 
And roughly speaking, the way you solve this will be the same the way you solve this. Okay. Up to now, there's no shortcut. Negative is no trouble. You probably need to stare at it for a while until you realize this is the derivative of our next. And we do have our next there. So if I do a u sub, I will have du, and I have some function with u all the time. So let u equals ln x, you will be able to do it. That's just a rough idea. Then let's do the original one. But this time, let me take it here. This time we're trying to do this. And the key is let u equals ln k over p. Calculate du. du is going to be 1 over k over p times k times negative 1 over p squared. times dp, of course. To finish that, just do the k, k over p, or times p over k. So let's do p over k times k times negative 1 over p, dp, cancel, 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 which is negative 1 over p, dp. Therefore, the left-hand side becomes 1 over u. P, negative P du, which gave you one over u du negative, which gave you negative ln u plus a constant. Okay, that's how we do the integration. Let's carry it to the differential equation then. We only need one constant and then solve for P. It's basically K over P equals E to the negative CT plus D, which is E to the negative CT times a constant D. And the P equals K over that. Dr. Chen. Yep. Didn't uh, we set u equal to the ln of k over p? What did I do? So when we substitute it back in, we get oh, the ln yeah. of the ln. It should be ln, ln. That will change something. P equals e to the negative ct times a d. K over p equals e to the d times e to the negative ct. P equals k over e to the d times e negative c times t. Okay, finally a plug in P0. Okay, find D at the finish. Okay, I will be right back.
Okay, is this one clear? Awesome. Okay, next time, just send me the email and I will pick up the homeworks. All right, 1.4, Euler's method. First thing we talk about is Euler's method. Basically what we do is, we start from the initial value, we take the derivative, okay? Track it down to the next point, keep going, and track it down to the next point and just keep going. Okay? So basically what we're doing is, we're tracking the vector field. Know it down to the former, then what you have is, you let zero t become a partition with n interval. The ending points are t zero all the way to t n. Then you use a scheme which is called y n plus y equals y n plus h f t n y n. Here we use the fact that the derivative is actually f t y. Therefore, basically what you have here is derivative of y. In this way, knowing y zero, you can find y one. Knowing y one, you can find y two, y three, and so on all the way to y n. Now you can see this is a recursive formula. You can easily code it with a for loop. That is called the Euler's method. Okay. Second thing we talked about was this. We showed an example. The example we showed was, I have something, y prime equals 0.1y, I know the solution, which I plot here. Then I did the Euler solution. What we did is we take one point, we take another point, we take another point, and just keep going. Okay, and this is what we got for Euler's point. Still okay? Then the problem here is we do have error. Therefore, we want to talk about numerical error. There are several things we need to talk about. The first one is the error is inevitable because you're trying to change something continuous to discrete. You're trying to change something curvy and replace it by something straight. Of course, you're gonna have a mismatch. And then we say, well, to make it smaller, you basically just need to let h goes to zero. Then the error reduce. That's the first thing. The second thing we talk about, my drawing is kind of accurate. That is, as you can see, as you go further and further and further, from the beginning, your error become bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. That is simply because your y1 has an error and your y2 has an error from y1 to y2 plus y1 has an error already. That's doubling the error. Still okay? So the more you go, you're actually getting more and more errors plus from a wrong information. Therefore, therefore your error accumulates. This is accumulated error. This tells us it works best for a small interval, zero T. If you want to predict the next hour, it's way better accuracy than if you want to predict for next day or next month or next year. 
okay? And if you want something better, you better just remember the initial condition after 10 days. So you restart over based on real data, not the data you calculated. So that includes remembering because you can trust your data. The third thing we want to talk about is going to be numerical method. And here's an interesting question. You know Euler's method. You know the error goes to zero as your h goes to zero. That means more resources will give you better accuracy, which is great. A hundred points is always better than 10 points. The more the better. Good so far? But now the second thing you want to do is, but sometimes you do have some limitations on how much resource you have. For example, you only have such a big machine, which can only handle 100 points, no more. Does it mean that you have to stop here and give up? Or is there a better way to design a method which is better than Euler's method, which with the same number of points, it has a smaller error? Make sense so far? Okay, there is a whole collection of methods. Euler method is just a start. You have a whole collection, numerical method. Each one has a pro and con, okay? If you're interested, there is a class called MTH 371 numerical methods offered in spring. And one quarter of that class is gonna be about how to solve differential equations using a computer you will be able to experience all kinds of method and see which one is the best, okay? If you are thinking going to graduate school in applied math and computational physics, this is definitely the class you wanna take. And this may very well be a really nice research uh, direction. So just keep in mind, numerical method is a huge research area, okay? And for applied math, people and also computational physics. This may be your career. Okay, so I won't show anything here anymore. Just keep in mind last time we showed something that we can prove which one has a better arrow, which means smaller arrow, okay. And which one use less resource, which means it's faster. Cool. Number four, sometimes you use some numerical method, it has some restrictions, so that method fail. Then you try some better method, which works. Still okay? But sometimes you do have a situation that is the original problem was bad. Therefore, no matter which numerical method you try, you never know where the mistake come from. Make sense here? It's possible that you chose the best bad method for your numerical. Or it's possible that your original problem was not solvable. How do you know which is which? Make sense here? Okay, I will show you a quick example. This is a DVQ uh, here. Actually, not this one. Let me do 1.5. Please take a look at this differential equation. You start from five, you have e to the t times sine y, okay? If you code it by Euler's method, it's super easy. And this is what I got from the solution. So what's going on here? Oscillation, things bumping around. Is it because Euler's method is bad? Well, let's take more points. Even more points. We already have 200 points from zero to six. That's very small h. You should be very close to your real thing now. So how many of you think that this is because our numer numerical method fail? 
or how many of you think about this is actually we're onto something here. That means the original differential equation give us some shock here. And that is a physical phenomena we should be really careful about. This is like solving general relativity, you just discovered a black hole because it's irregular, right? Which case? Can you see the problem now? Numerical method is really nice. You just want to type everything in Python and just see it. The problem is you need to know when it fails, for what reason, okay? Now if you try it for 2000, everything looks smoothly. Now here's the problem. What's happening? Does it mean that our original step sets are too big? Or actually, does it mean that we took too small h, we broke our earliest method? Actually, what we see here is wrong. The original thing was actually good. How do you know which one is which? Sounds good? Okay, that's the confusion here. Numerical method fail, or it feels like it's failing, but you actually don't know if it fails or actually you're onto something. That will be the last part for numerical method. That is the numerical error or numerical failure. Let's just say failure of numerical method. When you see something ridiculous, do you mean that you have some ridiculous things in your original function uh, problem or is there something wrong with your numerical method or actually you're onto something which is really meaningful in physics? You don't know. Therefore, we have to somehow rely on mathematics to get a rough idea to prevent such cases. We know we don't, we don't trust our calculations. We know it's difficult for us to manually calculate everything, but at least we want to get some information, not all, but some information. Okay, that is called existence. and the uniqueness of solutions to OD Okay, what do you mean by that? We mean two things. The first one is the existence of solution. You want to make sure you have at least one solution. Otherwise, it's not solvable. It's a real defined problem. So at least one. The second you want to make sure is the uniqueness. You want to make sure you only have one. You don't have two. Because if you run the Euler's method, you will always only get one solution. Your numerical method just, just work for one solution, right? Okay, so if you have two, you don't know which one you have. You don't know, maybe my solution is capturing both at the same time, that's why they start to oscillate. Maybe one is actually going up, one is going, going, going flat, right? So these two are important. And we do have those kind of results worked out for us. Okay, number one. Existence theorem. Suppose F T Y is continuous. In a rectangle, T Y, T is between A and B. Y is between C and D. If T0 of Y0, which is your initial value, is a point in the rectangle, then there exist a epsilon 
bigger than zero and the function yt defined for t0 minus epsilon less than t less than t0 plus epsilon that solves the initial value problem y prime equals f t y and the y at zero is t zero oh, y zero the existence is here All right, several comments. Number one, what does it mean? Well, you have a DVQ. Is it solvable? Number one, you need to make sure that this is nice. Or in another word, it is continuous. That's good enough. Second, what do you need? Not only you need this one is continuous in some rectangle from A to B, C to D, you also need to make sure that your initial value is in here. T0 by zero. Number two, if your initial value is here, if your function, which means your derivative is defined, well-defined, continuous, around here, then what you can guarantee is there is a solution. But that thing only exists for a limited interval, going from t0 to t0 plus epsilon and t0 minus epsilon. You can only guarantee the solution exists for finite time. If you're lucky, your epsilon can be a big interval. For example, it, it is good from negative 100 to positive 100. That means you're lucky. Okay, it can even be from negative infinity to infinity, then you're all done. The solution exists everywhere. Okay, but it's also possible that it exists only from negative 0.1 to 0.1, which is a very narrow area. In real life, how people handle this, it's actually not hard. Once you know it exists for here, by the existence theorem, right? Then you just attract this solution and go here. Pick this one to be your initial value. And make sure that this one exists from here to here. Can you see your interval become wider? Okay, you can then actually track down a further one. Okay, track it here and just keep extending, keep extending until this existence hit a barrier. This condition is not satisfied anymore. Then from there, you cannot extend anymore. So we call this extending the solution. Even though you have a restriction of your epsilon, actually you can extend it by running this one for multiple times. All right. Now I can give you an example. 
Let's try some easy ones first. Solve this initial value problem. Y prime equals one over T. Y zero equals four. Okay, how do you solve it? Well, y prime is one over t, then, then y is ln t. Plus a c. Okay, now you know y zero is four. You just need to plug in four equals ln zero plus a c. Now you see the trouble. Ln zero, what is ln zero? Undefined. Therefore, no solution. Sounds good? That means wasted. Everything from here to here, totally wasted time. Good news, it's an easy problem, so it's not a big waste. But imagine what if you spent three years in your PhD to solve a difficult differential equation, end up having this. Make sense here? That's the point you regret. I should have known better. Okay, and how do you do that? Well, let's forget about all this. We have the existence and the uniqueness theorem, right? Y prime equals one over T. Y zero is four. What do we need to check? Well, we need to check there is a box, okay, from A to B, from C to D. I need to make sure two things. Number one, my initial condition is in this box. Number two, the function is nice. Which function? One over T should be nice in this box. If that's okay, at least the solution exists for a while. Now, do you see where things go wrong? Here is zero four. That's your initial condition, right? But what is one over T? It's this. Okay, is it continuous everywhere in this box? No, it's not continuous at zero. Then don't even bother. Sounds good. In this way, we've saved all the trouble of doing all this. We can tell right away. Keep in mind though, this one basically tells you the existence fail. Uh, the existence theorem fails. That means you, you are not guaranteed to have a solution. Does it mean that there's no solution? Think about it, be careful here. Existence theorem fail, does it mean that there's no solution? Not really, it just means we are not guaranteed to have a solution, it's still possible. So it's sad, but this one is only a warning. This one doesn't tell you you should give up, but at least you got a, at least you got a warning. Later, as you go further and further in your career, you will find all other ways to tell you, to guarantee you there is no solution. Then that's better. That's when you know you should give up. Okay. So when I was doing research on partial differential equations, the first thing we do before we do any simulation is always prove the solution exists. Okay? If we cannot prove that, we don't do it. Not because that one doesn't have a solution. 
just because maybe we throw in three years and then it end up not having a solution. It's possible. As long as it's possible, we, we give up. Sounds good? Because we have other problems we can work on. So this is not automatically no. It just say there's no guarantee yes. Cool. That's existence. Now let's check uniqueness. Everything is roughly the same. Suppose F T Y and partial F partial Y T Y are continuous function in the rectangle T Y T from A B. Y from CD. If T0, Y0 is in the rectangle, okay, and if Y1, T, Y2, T are both solutions. Or let's just say both satisfy the initial value problem y prime equals f t y and y t zero equals y zero. For all t in this, then y one t equals y two t. Read it. Compare the difference with the existence. Okay. Can you see the only difference will be this requirement? For the partial derivative of f with respect to y, that's the only one additional requirement. Which is kind of interesting, right? Is that possible that you have a differential equation and you have two solutions and the one look like this and the other one look like this, but they both satisfy Then if you use Euler's method, you really don't know which one you're tracking. Or maybe you're tracking both at the same time. You don't know. Okay, that's the condition here. Oh, Andrew? Uh, yeah, at the um, end of the, the theorem, it says if y1 of t and y2 of t both satisfy the something. I, I can't read what the last thing says. But both satisfy the initial value problem. Okay. Okay. That means you have two solutions. The first one is y1, the other one is y2. They satisfy the same initial value problem. Then if the partial derivative with respect to y is continuous, you are guaranteed that these two solutions is actually one solution. This tells you this never happened. The red one and the black one should overlap each other. Then go ahead and try to run your numerical method. It's gonna work.
Sounds good? Let me give you some example. This way, you know how many solutions you should expect. Let's think about this one. Y prime equals three Y two thirds. Okay. Y zero is zero. Existence. Okay. Well, let's take a small thing. Let's take a, this one. Zero, zero is here. That's my initial condition. Let's draw a small box here. Is this function continuous there? For some small box containing zero? The answer should be yes, right? There's nothing wrong with the function, so continuous. Therefore, there is a solution. A solution. Existence, done. Uniqueness. For uniqueness, number one, I check everything about the, exi uh, the existence. Plus one more thing. That thing is partial f partial y, which is partial f partial y with a, with a three. Then just go ahead and take the derivative. You find it's y square, not y square, y, two times y to the negative one third, which is two over y to the one third. Sounds good. Okay. Is this one continuous? Not at zero. Okay, so not continuous at zero. Therefore, uniqueness fail. Which also means multiple solutions are possible. If you only find one, you should really start or think about finding more. That's by the theorem. Sounds good. Let's try to solve it. Do we know how to solve it? Well, we just did it, right? It's separable. And let's just not do this. Uh, y prime over y two thirds. Yeah. We'll take the integration. On the other side, we have 3t plus a c. On this side, we have y to the negative 3 half, which gives you y to the 1 third with a 3. Divided by one by three. CO3, we still write it as a C, which is a constant. Therefore, your Y should equal to three T plus C cubed. <clears throat> Somehow, I don't feel right or right about this one. Did I put a three there? Yes, I put a three.
somehow I'm messing up a three. Yes, this is a T here. Okay, that's right. Doc. Um, just to check, so we're taking the integral with respect to dt on both sides at the beginning? With respect to dt on both sides, and then y prime dt give you dy. Yep. Okay. And then Thank that's you. the whole point. Yeah, that's the whole point of doing separable. This is dy. Yeah. Now use y0 equals 0, which implies y equals t cubed. This is solution one. Sounds good. If you don't know uniqueness, you will go ahead and try to do this and you finished, that's fine. But now we know uniqueness fail. That means it's possible that we have another one. May not have another one, but it's possible. Can you just look at this differential equation, the initial value problem and find another solution? We clearly know this one is good. Can you see there is another one, a simple one? Plug in zero, you do have zero. And uh, the derivative of this one is this one to the two thirds. So this is another solution. That means if I need to draw it, given the initial condition and my derivative, I find two things. The first one is just this. The second one is this. There is no uniqueness of solution because my partial derivative fails. You try to do Euler's method, you can try it by yourself. It depends on how small your h is. Sometimes you will track this down. Sometimes you will track this down. Sometimes if you pick the h to be just right, you will bump between these two, back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. So your solution look like this. If you're a physics major, you get excited. This is a wave. Turns out it's not, okay? It's just either that one or this one, but it's not a wave. And that's the problem. All right, that's the uniqueness. We can't give you the proof and it's not in the book, but I think I can give you a rough idea why this little tiny condition is essential to make sure that this is unique. Why this? Again, this is not a proof. This is just like a, I don't know, rough, intuitive idea, it's not careful, but more or less. So you agree, right? We had uh, two things. The first one is y prime equals this. And we know y1 is a solution, therefore y1 prime equals f t y1 prime, now y1. We also know y2 is a solution. Therefore, y2 prime equals f t y2. We call this one, we call this two. Now what I'm going to do is I'm gonna use number one minus number two. I will have y1 prime minus y2 prime equals f t y1 minus f T, Y2. Stay okay? Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna define the function delta Y to be Y1 minus Y2. If I can prove delta Y equals zero for any T, then it's the same as saying Y1 and Y2 are the same all the time. Still okay? Good. 
Now let's take a look. Going from here. When delta y is super small, the left become delta y prime because prime is linear. This is almost like okay, partial f partial y times delta y. Okay, it's almost the same like saying almost the same as saying f x plus h minus f x is almost like f prime times times the difference between you guys times h. Right? This only works for when y1 and y2 are extremely close to each other. Okay? It's a linearization, basically. Then the thing in the red box can be rewritten into delta y prime equals partial f partial y, which is basically roughly a constant, times delta y. What do you see? That's the differential equation for delta y. Okay, you just need the initial value problem, then done. What is the initial value for delta y? A t0, sorry. Now here's the thing. You know that the first y1 solves the initial value problem. Therefore, y1 satisfy the initial value. Meanwhile, y2 also satisfy the initial value of the original initial value problem, right? Therefore, y1 minus y2 for t0 is just going to be zero because they're the same at the beginning. So we have another in initial value problem just for the difference between these two solutions. And how do you solve that? If this is a constant, it's so easy to solve. That is just delta y equals c times e to the partial f partial y, which is a constant, times t. And you still need the initial condition, right? Just plug in t0, you should get zero. That gives you exponential is never zero. So my only choice is c equals zero. If you plug in t0, zero, zero from here. Therefore, the only solution for this one is going to be delta y is always zero for any t. Therefore, the solution is unique because the difference between two solutions are always zero. Of course, it's unique. How did you do that? The essential part is try to write this one into this. How do you make sure that happened? You need to make sure partial f partial y is continuous. Therefore, I can do this linearization. That's why this is connected. All right. Now, of course, we said this only works for y1 and y2 are close to each other. What if they're not close to each other? No, again, just chop the whole thing into small pieces. Because we know linearization only works for small interval. The good news is you go from here, and then for a very small interval, the argument just now work. Therefore, you have a unique solution. But then you transfer the whole thing to here, you have a new starting point for a different interval, but the previous one was unique. Therefore, they have the same initial, initial value again. For this interval, you can prove this is unique. Still okay? 
So you can chop them into infinite many small pieces and each piece is, is unique to make sure that the next one starts from uh, the same point and then it's unique. Then to make sure the next one starts from the same point and then it's unique by the same argument, you finish the whole thing. Okay, that's why I say this is not a proof. For a proof, you need to complete all this. And if you're interested, try to Google something called ground, well, ground wall, actually. Inequality. Technically, the whole thing was done by an inequality. Okay. But the roughly the argument before works. Okay, that's all for today. Next time I will show you how to use this one to make sure that to solve the problem we just now with when all our method fail and we were able to identify actually it's the numerical method. It's not the original problem. We will show you how to do that. And uh, no class on Friday and homeworks, send me an email so I can prepare. Cool, class is over.